Good morning, everybody. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this w webinar, the first in the series on new energy technologies. My name is Norman Harris, and it's my pleasure to be your chair today. Um, <clears throat> you've all seen this slide, and I don't intend that you should read it, but there are over 500 people attending this event, which is a great encouragement to all the presenters and a recognition of the importance of the topic. You can submit questions at any time, and I'll try to see as many of them as possible are answered at the end of the presentations. I will not be giving the name or the affiliation of the questioner. I mentioned a series of webinars. The final slide of the presentation will be displayed for a few minutes and give the date, dates, I should say, of each of the four topics covered today that will be addressed regressed again in greater depth. You'll all see from this projection of the government's energy forecasts for the coming years up to 2030 plus, uh, that there is a tremendous growth in energy requirements. A lot of this will be taken care of by the renewables, which we'll be going to discuss today. But you will also see that the black line that slopes downwards, but is in the middle of the slide, is fossil fuels. So we'll be burning those for a considerable time to come to uh, keep our lights and energies going. Lights burning and energies going. Um, the final little blip at the bottom is actually carbon, coal with carbon capture and storage. So it is a probably the appropriate time for me to hand over to the next presenter who's going to deal with carbon capture and storage in depth. Steve. Thank you, Norman. Just to check you can hear me. Yes, indeed. Thank you, and thank you everyone for uh, joining uh, this very uh, topical um, first presentation in the series, as, as Norman has mentioned. Um, I'm Steve Johnson, uh, currently VP Digital at Petrofac. I'm going to talk very briefly um, about uh, carbon capture, utilization, and storage um, in the context of how uh, the skills that we've traditionally had in the oil and gas and process sectors um, are very relevant uh, to this uh, emerging and important technology. So what is uh, carbon capture? Um, in essence, um, if we think about what we've done for um, you know, many years now, uh, many decades in fact, in terms of extracting um, hydrocarbons uh, from reservoirs, using them in various uh, means, burning them and uh, uh, using them usefully to create uh, energy and other products, this is really uh, turning that into reverse. So um, as the name suggests, um, it's using uh, process technology to capture carbon, uh, usually from uh, process or exhaust streams, um, although increasingly there is an interest in what is referred to as direct carbon capture. So in that uh, approach, it is really capturing the carbon from the, uh, from the air, um, taking that carbon, cleaning it, and then uh, ultimately uh, sequestering it for storage, usually in some form of underground structure, um, which can range from deep saline aquifers uh, through to uh, depleted oil and gas reservoirs. So it's really um, about capturing that carbon, um, you know, looking for secure storage over the longer term, or ultimately, as the U in the name suggests, finding means to actually use that carbon usefully in some kind of industrial uh, process. So why is CCUS important? You'll see many um, charts like this. Um, Norman, in fact, showed one uh, which was more related to energy usage. But if we look at the challenge um, that we are posed to meet the net zero, the drive towards net zero, um, the carbon, you know, the Paris Agreement um, to try and uh, avoid unacceptable climate change, then we really are looking at changing the energy mix um, and doing that with an overlay of increased energy demand. You can see a range of technologies that are emerging through you know, increased electrification, driving more efficiency. But no matter how you look at this, the continued use of hydrocarbons, 
uh, the burning of traditional fuels that we've had, the use of those uh, you know, sources of uh, energy uh, as a means to support the energy requirements of industry, travel, etc., are foreseen to continue for the for the foreseeable future. Um, and without uh, you know, the use of a means to capture that carbon, sequester it, um, take it out of uh, you know, process streams and exhaust gases, then um, our ability to meet the energy demands of the future and also to meet our, our requirements in reducing CO2 emissions overall is very much limited. You can see on this slide some uh, figures that are related to the ability to meet the Paris agreements. Um, and on those projections, 15% of cumulative emissions you know, by 2050 would need to be uh, sequestered through carbon capture. And that equates to something like 2,000 facilities um, you know, being uh, in place and operational by 2040 uh, to basically uh, sequester sufficient carbon to meet those objectives. So quite a considerable uh, contribution and um, investment, capital investment in creating facilities which currently do not exist. If we look uh, basically at the UK um, and the challenge that we have set ourselves um, in this country you know, of net zero by 2050, CCUS is also a very major contributor. All the likely scenarios uh, that basically um, are being put forward by government and various industry bodies show the importance of carbon capture um, in being able to meet those objectives. In fact, you know, uh, my colleagues on this call are going to talk about other uh, potential energy sources, um, hydrogen, for example, which is the next presentation, and even being able to actually move uh, from traditional fuels to hydrogen will require in the, in the near term the ability to sequester carbon, take it out of uh, the process streams related to uh, the production of blue hydrogen, um, you know, as, as the green hydrogen technology becomes uh, more competitive. So the, the use of CCUS is a very important underpinning technology to allow us to achieve our net zero objectives um, and also to continue to support the energy demands of the future. Um, the other thing that uh, I mentioned earlier, which is becoming of increasing interest, and, and we are beginning to see um, organizations providing this as a potential service and an ability to offset emissions is the use of direct carbon capture. So sequestering carbon from the atmosphere directly um, and essentially being able to offset emissions that may be coming from things like air travel, et cetera, as they look for you know, alternative fuels and as that technology uh, you know, matures in the interim, providing the ability for them to confidently uh, uh, offset their carbon emissions. So like any technology, there are challenges with uh, carbon uh, capture, utilization and storage. A key one is economics. This is an emerging technology, although it's been around and looked at on a number of occasions over a number of decades, it's never really come to significant maturity. Um, and the economics and costs associated with CCUS still remain a challenge, but as we see um, the journey that and the interest that basically is growing in this area, um, those economics are likely to move uh, you know, more positively and, and encourage more development of, of facilities you know, providing this service. Um, the maturity of, the, of some of the technologies uh, needs to improve, um, and one of the key aspects is the ability to verify uh, manage and monitor and provide confidence that the carbon that has been captured is actually sustained, stored away in reservoirs or alternatives in a verifiable and confident manner. And there's a lot of work uh, going on at the moment in terms of understanding how that can actually be uh, verified, monitored and, and provided you know, with confidence to, you know, to, to us as users. And then the other piece here is that there are not a large number of successful um, major projects uh, in the CEC US space that have been taken through to completion currently. So, you know, uh, with any project, um, there, you know, there will be risks associated with the cost, the timescales associated with that, and clearly those risks are higher 
uh, where it is an emerging technology and there isn't a lot of track record and experience um, of completing such projects. So finally, what does this mean for individuals um, who currently are working in traditional process um, sectors and the oil and gas area? Um, well, I'm pleased to say that um, if you actually look at the typical chain of uh, activities, processes, and infrastructure that is needed uh, for CCUS to be successful, it very much plays to the strengths of the skill sets that were within that sector. Um, it's, you know, it, it's actually leveraging a lot of the facilities and the potential to leverage facilities that are um, mature in, in uh, the oil and gas sector. Um, and, it, and the skills that are utilized today from subsurface engineering through operations, maintenance, and supply chain and project management skills are all very relevant and transferable into this area. And that is, that is proven and shown already with the growing number of projects um, that are initiating in the UK alone uh, for CCUS as part of the uh, energy transition where many companies and many individuals who have traditionally worked in the oil and gas domain are seeing opportunities to bring their skills to bear in this area and help create these uh, facilities, you know, which are important to underpinning that uh, net zero transition. That's been a very quick overview in the context of uh, CCUS in the energy transition. Um, thank you for uh, listening. I'll be hanging around for any questions and I'll be handing over now to my uh, colleague, Steve Kramer. Good morning. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, Steve. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay. So I'd like to talk to you today about hydrogen. Um, it was discovered by Henry Cavendish and he called it inflammable air. But um, Hydrogen is actually a clear gas, although from uh, all the latest talk, you'll have discovered that there's a lot of colors now uh, connected with hydrogen. So I'd like to spend some time on this slide because there seems to be a lot of confusion about where the uh, sources of hydrogen actually come from. So green hydrogen is what we now call hydrogen, which is produced via electrolysis. Uh, from a renewable electricity source. So that's that's from your wind turbines, that type of thing. Uh, blue hydrogen, you probably had quite a lot of, is produced by natural gas. It produces natural gas, is hydrogen from the natural gas. It also produces CO2, and that can be captured uh, by CCS and then stored. So in order to be a blue hydrogen, this carbon has to be captured and stored. Yellow hydrogen can be produced from a solar power. So and this is one of the confusions. I quite often hear of a green hydrogen actually being called a electricity generated by solar power, but it's actually yellow is what it's supposed to be. Um, purple is light green, but it's produced to using nuclear power. So we're connecting up our nuclear uh, power stations. Turquoise, here we go, is produced from natural gas, but the product is solid carbon. So they can actually produce solid carbon, which uh, can then be dealt with. Now, grey, grey carbon is produced in the same way you uh, produce your CO2, you produce gas, methane gas, and then produce CO2, but you vent the CO2 into the atmosphere. So that's definitely not so uh, environmentally friendly. But that is how 95% of the world's hydrogen today is produced. The carbon is not captured. Brown and black is probably the least efficient of the lot, and that's produced from coal or lignite, brown being lignite. And finally, the uh, white hydrogen is naturally occurring hydrogen. We actually have reserves of natural hydrogen uh, in the earth and you can produce it. Unfortunately, you quite often need to use uh, fracking to do that. But there is natural resources of hydrogen, although very, very little of it is produced these days. So that's something that could be looked at in the future. 
So where are the jobs for engineers? So the green projects use electrolyzers to manufacture. And here's one company here, for example, which is, uh, and you can see our reference down in the corner, ITM Power. Um, they've amassed a backlog of 154 million pounds worth of work. So there is jobs now in this industry. Now, it's not just jobs in the chemical thing. You know, that to me looks like a container. There's all the technology that has to be made for that container, manufacturing of that container. So there's lots of jobs for engineers in that type of uh, industry. So it's, that has got a big potential. There's a big backlog of work there. Um, Hydrogen can be used to store energy, but it is inefficient. Now, I'm start, going to start talking about inefficiency of hydrogen because you have to, currently you have to make the hydrogen from something else, and that uses energy. So surplus energy from wind farms at night can be used to split hydrogen. There you go, you've got a surplus, so that's a, probably quite efficient. Um, but you'd only be able to produce enough hydrogen to heat about 11% of the UK's homes. And that's probably in the northeast of Scotland where the wind turbines are. So if we wanted to convert all the uh, gas boilers in the country to uh, work on hydrogen, we'd probably need to add about £100 to £2,000 to every new boiler in the country. When So the cost and efficiency there has got to be considered. Things do not happen unless it is efficient from a point of view of finance and uh, the environment. So to highlight this efficiency problem, uh, here's a slide from Tom Baker of Strathclyde University. Um, and it shows two ways to heat our house. Um, the International Energy Authority has said that no new fossil fuel boilers should be made or sold from 2025, which is in four years time. If the world is to achieve net zero by the middle of the century, we need to think about these things. So we could get our electricity from a, a wind turbine, put it through an electrolyzer, then ship it uh, to the house and put it into a hydrogen boiler. Efficiency, 50 to 60%. Or we could produce electricity from solar panels and then have a system heat up and the efficiency is 90 to 95 percent. So we need to look at the big picture. This is one of the things that I'm very keen that we look at the big picture and not just do what is convenient for a particular part of the industry. So as we said, methane, steam methane reforming is the most widely used way of producing hydrogen in the USA. And grey hydrogen is the way that we do it these days, 95% of that. So that's why CCUS needs to be really thought about if we're going to go down the hydrogen economy. So there's a very big uh, plant being considered for Teesside, BP are now looking at that. Um, it's going to be the largest in the UK, it's going to produce one gigawatt of blue hydrogen which could be about 20% of the UK's hydrogen target by 2030, which is nine years' time, and supporting the development of the region. So there is a lot of uh, interest there. If you want to know more about that, there's the information, bp.com. But if we just concentrate on the UK, we're not going to have a big impact worldwide. The UK, okay, the technology is here, the IMEC is here, but we're a global business. And we need to develop the technology so that it is economically viable and also good for the environment. So we need to keep on looking at the big picture. So to look at the big picture, I recommend that you get onto the website, the hydrogen map. This is an extremely useful piece, source of information, and it tells you where all the hydrogen and low carbon projects are being, their status and what is going on. If you want a map of the world of where the jobs are in the new hydrogen economy, there it is, the hydrogen map. So coming back to the UK, um, there is a big project on with the National Grid. This is the pipeline. Uh, and they're looking at possibility of converting the National Grid to a hydrogen grid. 
At the moment, 35% of the gas is power generation, 38% is uh, domestic use, and 23% is uh, industrial use. But you can see the pipeline there, and you can see Milford Haven, where at the moment, most of the natural gas is imported and as LNG and then pumped into the pipeline. So converting that to a hydrogen uh, pipeline is being looked at seriously. Uh, looked at whether we can spike the natural gas, put it in, split it, bring it out as hydrogen, or mix it with the gas and then start doing the same sort of thing as we're doing with our petrol, with our E10, with a percentage of environmentally friendly fuels. But there is a question about the energy density of uh, the most common fuels. And here's a graph which I've got from the EIA again. Um, it's very difficult to compare them, you know, because gases, are, hydrogen is a fluid, uh, gasoline is a liquid, diesel is a liquid, electricity is a electricity. So trying to compare the energy density of these fuels is quite difficult, and you have to look at it depending on what you want to do. There's some a lot of good information there, so you, if you're interested in that, I recommend that you go uh, to that slide. But there's a lot of work here. There's a lot of jobs for engineers in this. It's a really big developing industry possibility of moving on from our current technology. So some of the other things I've found is a, this, the government information, there's a hydrogen strategy issued by the UK government. There's also one by the Scottish government. Uh, and there's some really interesting documents from uh, being put out on the internet. So they estimate that about 30 times more offshore wind farm capacity than is currently available would be enough to produce enough green hydrogen to replace all gas boilers. So we need to look at the economy of scale. So this is my uh, my final slide. Some parts of the world see hydrogen as the green get out of jail free card, but when you start looking into some of the areas, it is, you lose efficiency. Every time you convert something, you lose, you create heat and lose energy and lose power and efficiency goes down. So you need to look at that. And we need to look at the energy and the environmental, but it has to be commercially available or it will not be used around the world. We need to develop technologies here which are uh, financially viable, commercially available, and then to give, give it to the rest of the world. Because the UK only produces about 1.2% of the world's carbon. Um, we've now got hydrogen planes. We're using hydrogen to make whiskey, which is a definitely a good thing, and we'll be exploring some of those in our next webinar on December the 21st. John, are you in there to take over? Yeah, hi, uh, Steve. Just checking you can hear me. I can hear you loud and clear. Fantastic, thanks. So uh, let me move this on. My name is uh, John Clegg. Um, I'm the Chief Technology Officer for a, um, a startup company called uh, Hefe Energy Technology. It was started by a colleague of mine in the States and myself. Uh, to develop the drilling technology that we think will be needed uh, for high temperature geothermal wells at scale. And today, I'm just going to give you a bit of an introduction to, uh, to, to geothermal. We've been using geothermal energy in the UK literally for thousands of years. And uh, you can see here a picture of the, uh, the, the, the Roman uh, baths in, uh, in Bath in Somerset, um, but not at scale. Uh, with the exception of some exciting stuff which is starting to happen in Cornwall, uh, United Downs and at the Eden Project, where we're uh, drilling uh, geothermal wells to uh, generate uh, electricity. Uh, but traditionally, um, geothermal hasn't been associated with something that uh, you can do other than in fairly small pockets around the world. When I started to look at it, uh, after spending about three decades in oil and gas, I was skeptical because I thought, well, geothermal wells, they, they tend to be drilled in places like um, um, Iceland and uh, New Zealand and Indonesia, where you've got you know tectonic activity and uh, hot rocks close to the surface, and, and you can drill for hot water and steam. Um, but actually, I began to realize that there is more potential than I thought. And um, uh, in th this slide here shows a number of different 
sort of types of geothermal. Uh, just just like with Steve talking about hydrogen, there's a lot of different um, sort of ways you can use geothermal energy. All the way from uh, very simple uh, ground source uh, heating pumps that you can use to heat a greenhouse, or sometimes to heat and cool your own house, all the way through to uh, generating uh, power from steam that you get by drilling uh, deep wells, uh, looking for hot water and steam in in places like uh, Cornwall. And incidentally, Steve, just to add, um, you mentioned about uh, making uh, whiskey from hydrogen. I think one of the uh, byproducts in Cornwall is they're actually making gin using the geothermal energy down there. So uh, another good thing. Um, but uh, in order to operate at scale, uh, you need different technologies. And um, my colleague and I became quite excited about the potential of geothermal when we saw the development of enhanced and advanced uh, geothermal systems. And anybody who's familiar with uh, oil and gas wells will see that um, these actually, what you can see on the screen is horizontal wells that look very much like uh, horizontal oil and gas wells. Um, EGS, the system on the left, will have a number, shows two in this particular case, but a number of parallel wells. Uh, one's an injector in blue, one's a producer in red. And you basically pump uh, fluid, uh, which could be water or incidentally could more likely be liquid CO2, uh, because uh, CO2 goes super critical, um, lower than uh, water does. Um, pump the cold fluid down. Uh, then use fractures in the formation, and um, here's the controversial part. In EGS systems, these fractures could be uh, artificially stimulated, just like fracking oil and gas wells, uh, which may cause problems in certain parts of the world. But the fluid flows through the fractures, gets heated by the heat in the rock, and then uh, goes back to a surface and uh, into a plant where it's converted into electricity. Uh, AGS systems on the right actually drill something that looks a bit like a downhole radiator. Uh, where you would drill a number of uh, interconnecting parallel uh, horizontal wells and just have a complete closed loop system where you pump uh, fluid down uh, uh, the right hand side on this particular slide and it comes back up uh, hot on the, uh, the left hand side. Now, the great thing about these technologies is that you no longer require, um, you have to find reservoirs in fractured rock where there's hot water present. All you need is heat. And if you go down deep enough, uh, there's always enough heat beneath our feet to uh, make geothermal energy work. And sometimes uh, you might have to go down five kilometers, sometimes 10 kilometers, depending on where you are in the world. But uh, it's just a question of how deep you go. So the key benefits of geothermal, and one of the things that made Steve and I very excited about it is um, illustrated on this graph here. Um, or these two graphs here. The graph on the left shows GHG emissions uh, by power generation source. And you can see that geothermal energy, it barely registers. Its overall total cycle uh, emissions are, um, uh, are very small. You've basically got to, you've got to drill the wells and complete the wells and you've got to build the power station. And uh, from then on, it's um, pretty much emissions free. Uh, but on the right hand side, you can see capacity. And this is basically telling you uh, how much uptime there is and how long the uh, energy is available for. And unlike things like um, solar, which um, is of limited use at night without storage, and uh, wind, which is uh, of limited use if, uh, if the wind isn't blowing, again, without storage, um, geothermal is available pretty much 24-7 uh, and uh, 365 days a year. And then, of course, the other concern could be about cost. And there's quite a lot of detail on this slide. Um, but based on uh, a study by uh, Lazard, um, but it shows that the levelized cost of um, electricity using uh, geothermal, and these numbers are in US dollars per megawatt hour, um, is in the range of uh, 60 to $100. Uh, it's already cheaper than nuclear or coal, and uh, it's just about overlapping with the cost of generating electricity from, uh, from natural gas. And uh, geothermal at the moment is quite a small industry, so it doesn't have the kind of scale and kind of economies that have benefited uh, other renewable industries. If you look at this graph shows how the cost of wind and the cost of solar have come down over the, uh, the, the last decade and uh, dramatic falls in cost are possible. And if you look at the next slide, um, this shows what um, horizontal drilling uh, did for uh, oil and gas production in the US in their unconventional fields. 
And here, uh, technology uh, significantly drove the value of the wells and the amount of, uh, in this case, oil and gas production. And we believe that technology can do the same for uh, geothermal. We can significantly increase the value of the uh, wells by getting a lot more heat, by getting exposure to more heat, by drilling better wells. And uh, we can also uh, reduce the cost by uh, uh, drilling factory wells, if you like, cookie cutter wells uh, to a template, uh, much like has been done in the US in their unconventional fields. So just to conclude, um, barriers um, and challenges, and of course the flip side of challenges is all about opportunities. Um, I think one of the problems that geothermal has got is um, is an image problem at the moment. It's seen as a bit of a, uh, a niche type cottage industry uh, based on a very limited number of hydrothermal wells that are around the world, but it has the potential to get uh, a, a lot bigger. Um, my colleague and I, calculated that if geothermal was able to provide 16% of the world's uh, electricity by 2050, looking at how much more electricity is going to be needed, we'd have to drill about a million geothermal wells. We thought we were mad when we put those numbers together. Um, I recently attended a uh, big online geothermal conference, Pivot 2021, which is now available on YouTube if anybody's interested. There's about a week's worth of uh, panel discussions there. And it was interesting to hear uh, companies that are going to be drilling these wells talking about drilling maybe 20,000 wells a year. And 20,000 wells a year means that our, our estimate of a million wells over 30 years is actually not very far off base. Uh, so it could become a big industry. Um, ownership of heat as a resource is uh, one issue that we need to resolve. Um, if you're extracting heat, it's not like extracting uh, minerals or fluids. Um, there's, it's not entirely clear who owns the heat at the moment. Um, BGS, the British Geological Society, has done some good work on that, if anybody's interested in, uh, in looking in a bit more depth. And, uh, of course, I mentioned fracking earlier, which is one of the ways of producing um, uh, unconventional geothermal wells, but not the only one. And, uh, yeah, fracking could be a problem in uh, Europe and uh, the UK. So we may finish up purely looking at advanced geothermal systems here. Uh, our opportunities really is that the technology to drill and complete um, the wells is very similar to the technology we use in oil and gas wells. The primary difference is temperature and um, oil and gas tools really don't go much above 175 Celsius, maybe sometimes up to 200. Uh, we're going to be looking initially at 225 Celsius and possibly higher temperatures uh, for um, drilling geothermal wells at scale and to maximize production from them. But um, that's going to create a lot of opportunities for uh, engineering uh, new products and uh, uh, especially things like new materials, new electronics technologies and so on. That was a very brief overview. Um, I have um, a date in January, 31st of January, where we're going to go into a bit more of a deep dive on this. So I hope people are interested and uh, will come to that. And uh, now I'm going to hand on to uh, my colleague, uh, Matthew. Thanks very much, John. Uh, we all clear the microphone? Yeah, I can hear you. Brilliant. So to finish off our whirlwind tour of energy, I'm going to be talking about wind energy. Uh, my name is Matthew Vasquez. I'm the chair for the Institution of Mechanical Engineers Scottish Region. And I'm also a director of an engineering and training consultancy project engineering management. So I speak to a lot of businesses, particularly within Scotland, but also with, throughout all of the UK, uh, manufacturing and engineering businesses, about the challenges that they have uh, skills and those sorts of areas as well. I'm going to be talking mainly about the skills part of the wind energy. Um, everyone's mentioned that they've got uh, webinars coming up over the coming months. We'll be doing one on wind energy in February. So joining me with that and part of the, the wind team is the senior project manager for Westus, uh, Vestas Wind Systems, David Reetham. So he'll be helping on some of the more technical side. I'll be looking at the skills size in particular. And I do a lot of training through the learning and development team of the IMECI. So these slides are part of a course which we're launching for this topic. If you look at the news, wind energy is everywhere. You know, the, the call for action, particularly in Scotland, if you look the, you know, everywhere you go, there's wind turbines. The politicians, the government claim that you know, this is the future. We all know that the green energy is the future. 10 point plan, they say, will support 90,000 highly skilled green jobs, 250,000 by 2030, 
there's all sorts of numbers being thrown around about the potential for green energy being the future. That doesn't mean that oil and gas is going to go anywhere soon, but we need to be looking to the future of what skills that we have now and how we can transition the skills we've got to get jobs in the future because it's going to be continuously evolving and changing. If you look at have have a look at the relative market size and we're going to talk I'm going to speak mainly about the oil and gas industry because I'm living in Aberdeen I see oil and gas as the main industry here but a lot of the skills for oil and gas are transferable to the wind and other renewables. If you can't see what these boxes say, the top left one says oil and gas decommissioning. The bigger the box, the bigger the opportunity for the oil and gas supply chain. Very closely linked for these skills. The next top two in that row are offshore wind and carbon capture and storage. There's a huge amount of similarities between working in oil and gas or developing skills in oil and gas and working in a lot of these sections. Steve talked about hydrogen. That's the bottom left corner, another, another big one as well. So hydrogen and energy storage, carbon capture, are maybe some of the longer term, larger prospects, but more of the immediate ones that I see are, are the decommissioning and the wind related ones. Opportunities for the oil and gas sector in general. Again, you've got decommissioning at the top, but I'm going to be talking about offshore wind. So that's number two in the list. The, one, the skills that are most closely related would be facilities engineering, subsea engineering, or subsea uh, industries, and the support groups. So I'm going to go into a little bit more detail now about what specific skills are needed what specific skills that you have that could be transferred into that. And you'll notice again, the top, top possible ones there, decommissioning, offshore wind, hydrogen, carbon capture storage, they're all the top ranked uh, opportunities in the sector. If we look at wind turbines in general, most people see the wind turbines sitting either on, in, on the land or on the offshore as well. And I think, well, you've got to be something to do with electrical engineering to be involved in it, or it's got to be something to do with building the turbines in general. But the life cycle or the whole supply chain for wind turbines is massive. And it comes all the way back from surveying the vessels, surveying with the vessels or planes or something like that to understand where you can put the turbines, where they're best suited based on the wind, studies, we've got to install. Uh, subsea, we've got to install uh, using ships and vessels the same way we, we do with oil and gas. We've got to build the equipment, so it could be structural, mechanical, electrical, pipelines, cables. We've got to install it with the vessels, like I mentioned. Then we've got the operations part of it, so we've got to work out how we're going to operate it, getting on the, the, the boats, the ships. All sorts of skills are needed other than just the most obvious ones that we can see. The life cycle of the wind turbine is quite large. And if I link this to what I would call the asset management life cycle, and if you're not familiar with asset management, there's a standard ISO 55001, which is very similar to the ISO 9001 quality management standard. And it talks about the life cycle of an asset being all the way from buying the equipment operating and maintaining are usually combined together and then we've got to decommission and dispose of it. The wind turbine life cycle is in the same. Development and consent, build it, install it and commission it. And this is usually around about five years of, of capital costs, capital expenditure, capex. The operations and maintenance are the biggest part of it. This is about 25 years um, the life cycle of a wind turbine is typically 20 years with about a five year extra on top of that if you can get the dispensation sometimes and then decommissioning towards the end. So the life spot cycle of wind turbines is actually a lot longer than what they look like. If you're a contractor and you're wanting to provide services to the wind industry, the same sort of model can be applied. You've got the development and consent part of it. You want to do studies. You might need to supply the vessels, supply the turbines, or supply the services. 
You then need to supply um, all of the supporting structures, so the electrical foundations, cables, uh, foundations, and then operating and maintaining, which again takes the 20 to 25 years portion of those. So the life cycle needs to be taken into consideration about where your skills fit into this, not only as an individual, but also as a business. Where can you provide value into this supply chain to help drive this growth? It's taking some time to transfer to the next slide. Now this is a, a, from the journal One Earth, so it's a little bit of a different slant on the, the government one I showed you before. But the message is still the same. Fossil fuels is going to shrink eventually. It's not going to happen tomorrow. I live in Aberdeen. I don't expect to be moving anywhere soon from Aberdeen just because of the oil and gas industry. But it is something to plan for in the future. What market is it going to be? Now again, in Aberdeen, they've recently uh, promoted that the energy transition hub, the energy hub is just going to be built just offshore at the new harbour in Aberdeen. So already we're thinking about as an industry how we can move from fossil fuels to some of these renewables. You'll notice a lot of the big companies are changing their names to have energy at the end of it. So they're not seen just as oil. We can use these skills to get into these roles. But if we're looking at wind energy in general or in, in, in specifically, I guess, this is not a new industry. It's been around for a long time and it's actually quite late to be getting into the wind energy industry. But it doesn't mean that you can't do it. It just means it's a little bit harder to do because it's already quite a developed market. So how can you get in there yourself as a skilled engineer or maybe a graduate engineer coming up into this industry? Here's a list of some of the jobs that I've pulled out from that one slide earlier about the life cycle of a, of a wind turbine. Development and surveys and studies, this is all at the start of the acquire. We've got to do, we need project management, we need geotechnical land surveys, wildlife, environment. We've got to look at the structures, the foundations of it, whether it's on land or offshore. It may be noticed in the news that a lot of them are starting to come loose in the, in the seabeds because of the, the geo because uh, of the uh, underwater conditions. What about training, uh, rigging, crane operators, vessel crews? We've got to fabricate the towers. We've got to do non-destructive testing, rope access, electrical supplies. Maybe you're on the environmental side. What happens if we get oil spills or environmental issues? Uh, the vessel operators are going to be on the boats. Uh, the only way you can get out to these wind turbines is by vessel. Operations and maintenance is the biggest part of the life cycle. So this is where a lot of the business skills will come into it. You can operate, you can do maintenance, asset integrity, computer monitoring, simulations, maintenance. We want to inspect the blades, the blades wear out. So we've got a, lots of really good pictures that you see quite often about people up on wind turbines at dizzying heights, inspecting that. So. Think broadly about the whole life cycle of a wind turbine, about what skills that they need from start to finish. How do you get into those? What skills have you got to offer? You'll notice here that a lot of these are transferable. Steve talked about hydrogen. He talked about carbon capture storage. All of these sorts of things are very closely related to the same skills. So this isn't just for wind turbines. So how do you get a leg up or how do you get a career in renewables? So here's, here's some of the tips and areas that I, I like to suggest that you can use your skills or maybe develop your skills. There's three main areas. There's the service and technician level. So this is the, the trades sort of area. You can become an apprentice and get in earlier or you can be an experienced fitter or electrician, for instance, and get in that way with skills you've already got. It's easier to get in at the entry level than it is to get in as an experienced person. So the earlier you can get involved in this, apprenticeships, graduate apprenticeships is one of the best ways to get into this industry. Part of that is going to involve traveling though. I was speaking to a 
provider of wind turbines last week and they were saying that in the UK they were offering six graduate apprenticeship roles and they had over a thousand applicants but the same type of roles that they're offering overseas they can offer a hundred or more of the same roles because that's where they're based rather than the UK so look at what's in what's the areas in the UK that are specific whether that's down in Hull or down in those areas for different parts of it Scotland perhaps for different areas as well look at what graduate apprenticeship roles that you can get into the other one I talk about is feeder engineer so again the graduate scheme the university route get the foundation and the fun fundamental skills first and then get in at an early career into that business from the university graduate level the harder route is to be to get in at that expert level and the reason the reason for this is because as I said it's been around for quite a long time and there's a lot of experts in the field so there's a lot of competition to get into this area so either become an expert or if you're already an expert try to transfer in that way research what companies are offering roles or what recruitment companies are advertising those roles sign up with them all get to know them and get your name out there the word of mouth for the for the renewables or for the wind turbines is the best way to get a job not all of the jobs will be advertised so you have to build up your network and get in that way demonstrating what you've done sign up for marketing magazines online go to conferences job sites um, connect and post on social media you need to demonstrate why your skills are needed because there's a lot of competition university the IMECI has seminars conferences institution days make sure that your CV shows the transferable skills some of those I mentioned in the last slide and the last one there speak to your contacts in your network the wind industry is a really good industry to progress if you're a hard-working achieving person you know if, if you can demonstrate achievement in that role it's very hard to move up by default like it is in some of the other other areas so get involved speak to as many people as you can look at the sites and get known for what it is it's not too late to get into it it's just now is it when you're going to need to do it if you are wanting to do it I mentioned at the start there that I do training through the IMECI and today is actually the launch day of this uh, new training course that we've got coming up in December wind energy fundamentals if that's of interest talking about some of the technical skills and how you can get into the industry go on to the IMECI website to look a bit more of that and as we mentioned earlier there's also a webinar on the 28th of February that we're looking at wind energy in um, more detail so David from Vestas Wind Systems will be joining me for that one hour webinar so make sure that you keep an eye on that I think that about covers all of our areas so if you haven't already done so please keep the, the questions coming in and I'll hand it back over to Norman to, to go through the panel discussion thank you very much uh, thank you gentlemen can you hear me all right yes we can do good um, a couple of questions I will address myself. Uh, one, we've had some questions on will these slides be available? Uh, yes, they'll be on the IMACI website in due course. The second one was about uh, modular nuclear reactors and the inferring of price or economics comparison between the, that and the slides that we've talked about. Uh, we did discuss it in the planning, and I think we will probably come up with a, a, a small modular reactors uh, presentation later in the piece. Right, the first questions. Um, going to my priority box. Um, two, about the integrity of undersea storage of CO2. Uh, so I direct that to, uh, to Steve, Steve Johnson. And uh, perhaps you could just say how secure the undersea storage is, and is there a danger to the acidification of the sea? 
Steve. Steve Johnson. Oh, we seem to have lost him. I do apologize on that. No, uh, I'm Steve, Steve Cromer here. I could oh, possibly there. one. Steve All right, Cromer thank here. you, Steve. As, a, as yeah. an ex drilling engineer uh, working in the oil industry, um, one of the things we did was actually drill into reservoirs which had contained oil and gas for millions of years. Uh, occasionally you would see shows in different parts of the world. You certainly see that in, in parts like Abidjan and that where there's gas actually es escapes into the into the uh, atmosphere. You have flames. But if, if a reservoir has actually managed to contain it for millions of years, there's no reason why the carbon uh, CO2 should not be also contained for millions of years, provided we plug the wells properly and monitor the wells. So it, it's a bit of a, a, a difficult question to answer, but the basis is that the hydrocarbons were can, contained there for millions of years, so the carbon should also be contained there. Thank you, Steve. The next one goes to John, but geothermal. Um, a couple of questions about that. Um, first, the technologies that employed. There's mention of the fish bones technology being used in eastern Canada, which you didn't cover, John. Perhaps you give a comment about that. And then a more domestic one, which would probably interest a lot of people, uh, about how to install it as a domestic heating system. John. Okay, yeah, that, that's um, a couple of very different questions. I'll, I'll take the one about fish bones first. And yeah, I am aware of the fish bones technology. I, I, I came across it in uh, oil and gas. And um, it is, um, you need a significant number of fractures because you need to get a lot of surface area um, between to communicate between the two wells, between the injector and the uh, producer well because the, uh, the the heat basically comes from contact between the fluid and the uh, formation uh, in the holes. So I'm not sure if um, fish bones will give you enough surface area, but I guess if you if you produce enough holes, and if you can get those small holes to intersect the uh, the, the sister well, then it, it could be something uh, worth looking at. I hadn't seen it used in um, proposals for geothermal, but uh, I think it's an interesting thing to explore, and I think you've stimulated me to go off and do a little bit of research uh, on it uh, after the event. And the the other question was about domestic installations, right, Norman? Yes, indeed. Yes. Yeah, I mean, all, all the work I've done and all the research I've done has been on um, deep wells, which are similar to uh, on a gas well. So I'm not an expert on domestic installations, and I would hate to mislead anybody. Um, I, I think it's probably something which is specific to the application. Um, I think important things to consider would be the amount of land area available and also the thermal gradient locally, um, which is basically how much hotter it gets as you as you go deeper. But generally, for based on my own experience of friends who've had it done, uh, for domestic uh, heating and cooling, you don't need a lot of temperature difference. And uh, so, um, you, you shouldn't need to go particularly deep. All right. There's another question on geothermal, John, if I can press you again. Is is there any evidence yet or any knowledge yet on the lifetime of a geothermal well? Uh, yeah, yes and no. Yeah, um, yes and no. Oh, I've got a really bad echo there for a moment. No, you're okay, okay. Yes you're clear no. enough. Um, Okay, good. Uh, for hydrothermal wells, um, thinking about wells in places like uh, California, I know they're running up against issues with uh, depletion because you're producing water from the earth and that water has to be replenished by something like rain. So, um, and, and you know, there, there could be climate change uh, inferences uh, here as well. Um, be, so that if you are, um, if you're trying to produce a fluid that's in the ground, if you've produced all the fluid, just like with an oil and gas well, that when there's nothing left, it becomes problematic. With the closed loop systems that I was talking about, which I think are the future of geothermal energy, um, you're introducing the fluid from the surface in, in a closed loop. And so there's no depletion type uh, issues there. And um, then I think it's just a question of how long the uh, 
installation lasts, you know, how long the power station is going to last before it uh, needs to be replaced and uh, whether you get any long-term issues with um, the materials used in the, the completion of the well. But I think you could be talking about at least 50 years, maybe 100 years for uh, one of these installations to run, which ironically presents a bit of a challenge because uh, it gives you a much longer period over which to uh, justify the, um, the investment, which can be good. But uh, I think a lot of investors are more comfortable with stuff that pays back more quickly. So uh, um, that... The, the, the longevity could ironically become one of the challenges of uh, of these installations. Thank you, John. Um, the next question was about uh, batteries and hydrogen, and it gives us a clue, I think, as to what our final presentation should be, because it's again about the comparative comparative economics of batteries and hydrogen for transportation. Uh, so I, I think I'll say to uh, our organizer in chief and Noel in the audience that perhaps we should look at that along with uh, small modular reactors as a, as a later event. Um, yeah, I think I, think I could uh, give a wee bit of uh, an outline on that one if you want. Um, Thanks. Go ahead then, Steve. Go ahead. So looking at hydrogen as a as a, a energy source for transport or electricity, you know, battery power, uh, you're probably all aware that Aberdeen now has the hydrogen buses. Almost all of the buses here are in hydrogen, and they're they're working really well. You know, the it's efficient. They are uh, generating the hydrogen at night time. It's a local uh, generator there, storing it, etc. So I think yes, that's it, both of them have got a place. But what I would suggest is to take into consideration not just the uh, the energy density and the viability and the how super these batteries are today is. If you think about the storage mechanism for hydrogen, it's a dirty great big tank with no leaks on it. So it's a piece of metal. The storage mechanism for a battery is using a series of rare earths, which are becoming more and more scarce as the world uses up this battery technology. So, yes, I think energy storage is probably better and technology has moved on, but there is an inf there is a finite amount of batteries can be made with what we have. And on the other hand, in hydrogen, I think we can make some big steel tanks to hold it. So it's definitely going, both of them are going to be part of the mix, is what I would suggest. Thank you, Steve. Um, coming back to you again, Steve, hydrogen, uh, your slides, uh, showed the energy density of the various alternatives. And I think we're aware that hydrogen has lower energy density than normal town gas. Oh. Uh, can you comment about that? Because the, the, the relative volumes and therefore the effect on the pipe sizes? Yeah. So if you're looking at a, a, a house, uh, I can give you my own experience uh, recently. Um, I had an old conventional boiler which I was using and I used up a certain amount of gas and then uh, I switched over to one of the more modern condensing boilers and the amount of, amount of gas that that thing uses is much, much smaller and my bills are much, much smaller. Uh, so that was actually a misconception, me keeping that old boiler going. So the amount of these pipes were actually sized for the older type of boilers, older technology, old inefficiency. And when you change over to hydrogen, I think you'll find that the pipe sizes we have in the UK, which were basically taken in uh, cooking and at one time lighting, will probably be sufficient for the, for the hydrogen economy, which we're looking forward. Plus, we have uh, insulation today, so we probably don't need to generate as much heat. Uh, the graph the graph was actually a download of a, a, a very, very large a table from the Energy Institute, a, and you can download whatever you want from that. That was just a snapshot of that. There's a lot more to that table. So if anyone's interested, go to the original table and then look at what's there. You can work out your density either by weight or by volume or whatever you want to look at. Thank you, Steve. Next questions, two I'm going to combine for, for John. Uh, drilling of deep thermal wells, is any 
concern for impact on the structure of subsurface structure of planet Earth and also on uh, geothermal. Is there any impact uh, on water? Does it need any water treatment or, or is it not requiring any water? Okay, yeah, those are really good questions. And, um, yeah, can you, can you hear me, Norman? Yes, indeed. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, both really good questions. Um, I'll, I'll take the one about um, the planet Earth first. Uh, we've in the oil and gas industry, we've drilled many thousands of um, of wells over the uh, over the years. Um, some of them very deep, and um, drilling a small diameter deep well of itself, um, I don't think uh, introduces any significant structural risk. Um, Having said that, uh, and also geothermal wells, they're slightly bigger than oil and gas wells, but but not not much bigger. Um, uh, just to provide context, an oil and gas uh, reservoir section might be between six and eight and a half inches in diameter. Uh, geothermal would be between about eight and a half and twelve and a quarter inches in diameter. So they're they're kind of say, you know same order of magnitude. Having said that, um, I put up two different types of. Um, uh, installation that uh, are currently being looked at and funded. Um, uh, a lot of startups are getting a lot of money to drill these EGS and AGS wells. And the EGS wells, not AGS, just EGS, require um, uh, stimulation. Uh, and what's, uh, you know, in the common parlance is known as uh, fracking, hydraulic fracturing of the formation. And there is a risk with fracturing of um, what the industry calls induced seismicity events, which uh, the rest of us will call earthquakes. Uh, and I think there have been a couple of events in Europe when people have been drilling um, um, sort of experimental uh, EGS wells. So that's an area that uh, requires um, uh, a little bit more study, um, but that's not an area that is of concern to drilling uh, advanced geothermal systems, closed loop wells, because there's no fracturing uh, involved in that case. On the question about water, uh, for hydrothermal wells, um, there can be some challenges. Uh, when you're actually producing water from the formation. Uh, anybody who's been close to a um, uh, sort of a, a geyser in like California or Iceland or somewhere like that uh, will know that there's quite often a strong sulfurous uh, odor. And uh, unfortunately, one of the things that you quite often will co-produce is uh, H2S, hydrogen sulfide, uh, which can is obviously you know sort of hazardous, so you have to be able to deal with it. Uh, but also can cause um, quite a bit of uh, sort of uh, damage to equipment. And some of the, geo the hydrothermal wells that are drilled do have a bit of an environmental footprint, which is not in terms of CO2 emissions, but in terms of dealing with and uh, disposing of the uh, materials that you produce. Having said that, it's not always bad. Uh, if we go back to the example of Cornwall I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, one of the things that's being co-produced is uh, lithium. Um, you. Uh, quite often get lithium present where there's tin present. We all know there was tin present um, because it was mined in Cornwall, you know, sort of uh, hundreds of years ago. Um, and uh, with um, the requirement for battery technology, lithium is quite a useful thing to have now. So it's quite nice to be able to co-produce something which is useful uh, as well. For closed loop systems, um, the EGS systems, because you fracture through the rock, you do have the possibility of um, taking salts and uh, other materials out of the rock and uh, producing those, but you don't have to use water. Um, you can use something which is uh, less reactive, and uh, it's actually quite possible that liquid CO2 is a um, better material uh, than water for, um, for, for using in these uh, closed loop systems. And I think by picking the right fluid, you can mitigate the possibility of, um, of, of collecting materials as you go and having to uh, deal with them. And in fully closed loop systems, which are either lined or fully cased, um, there's no contact at all between the formation and the uh, working fluid. And so then there's no risk of uh, picking up anything that you'd have to uh, subsequently deal with and treat. So, yeah, back, back to you, Norman. Thank you, John. Thank you, yes. Steve Johnson, are you with us? No. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Oh, is that Steve Johnson? Hello, Steve. Yeah, Steve Johnson here. Sorry yeah, okay. about earlier. I Sorry. don't know what happened there. We lost you, yes. Well, just a question, uh, one of my favorite topics, direct air capture, direct air capture. And the question is, does it make sense to put big plants in to extract carbon from small percentages in the air compared with trying to 
attached to uh, boilers and other other sources of pollution. So I think you know certainly if you look at the economics of direct air capture from a um, carbon capture perspective, um, the jury is probably still out. You know the the economics are not you know um, as good um, you know as using um, CCUS um, on process streams and uh, exhaust uh, gases. Uh, but many organizations are actually looking at it from a perspective of um, how you will actually mitigate emissions um, indirectly. So um, you know, many people will be aware of the idea of uh, offsetting carbon emissions. So if we look at the immediate term in terms of challenges for uh, transportation like air travel, and yes, we are looking at new types of aircraft running on different fuels, but in the immediate future, they are not uh, going to be a panacea in terms of solving the problems uh, with emissions associated with that kind of transport. And then there are other uh, what are termed hard to abate sectors. Um, offsetting through things like planting trees, etc., are increasingly being challenged as uh, you know, somewhat questionable in some cases. You know, is that what's termed greenwashing? Um, and organizations are looking at a more uh, uh, auditable, more traceable um, uh, you know, route to actually offset the emissions that they're making. Um, and you know, even, you know, um, even at this moment in time, you know, memorandum of understanding have been signed by you know, some big organizations like uh, Virgin, for example, for their um, air transport to actually offset their emissions going forward using that type of uh, technology. So the economics is not over, you know, are overarchingly favorable, um, but you know, there is sufficient interest in the, you know, for the reasons I've explained that um, I think you know, um, it is something that will be part of the picture going forward. And of course, as greater interest comes through and more plants are developed and we have more capability in terms of carbon capture capacity, then those economics are likely to improve. Thank you, Steve. I've changed the slide. This is the dates for the events that follow up on this seminar. Uh, I'm going to suggest to our organizers that the reprise concentrates a lot on the economics, because I've got more questions about the economics of the various alternatives <coughs> to conventional generation. I'm coming down to my last two questions. Uh, the first one's back to Hydrogen uh, and Steve. Um, clearly, I think I raised with him offline uh, about the safety of hydrogen, remembering the great tragedies uh, of the airships of the past. And the other one is about, uh, in a similar vein, what monitoring equipment would have to be in the home if we start to feed hydrogen into the home. Steve. Yes, thanks very much. So the, the reason we remember these big hydrogen disasters of the airships is that they were actually filmed and uh, put into the cinemas as a newsreel, so everyone remembers those. There was a lot of other actually accidents that happened that weren't filmed, which actually caused more more harm. But certainly, um, I'm, I'm old enough to remember the transition from coal gas to natural gas, and those two questions came up at that time. And if I'm not mistaken, I think they put a, a smell into the gas stream so that people can detect it easier with natural gas. So I don't see a reason why they can't do that again with uh, hydrogen. I think it's what it is. Um, but certainly um, monitoring it is probably a reasonable thing to do uh, and make sure that there's there's no gas leaks in how, uh, houses or whatever. So that's things that can be done. There is hydrogen detectors, I know, uh, available for yachts and things like that when they're charging the batteries so that people don't go down with a cigarette and, and blow the boat up. That's happened before. So certainly that, that has been looked at. But um, certainly the, the whole, all the issues around about uh, hydrogen safety have to be fully fully shut down. I'm not an expert in that area of, uh, of that industry. Thank you. I remember going to British Gas's research station. Uh, Ernest Shannon was in charge of it, a great member of the IMEC-E, uh, and uh, they found that the 
switch from town gas to natural gas was causing the uh, seals in the pipelines to dry out and causing mm. leaks that way. So there yep. are changes. Yep. Final yep. question, and I thank the audience, uh, but final question to uh, Matthew. Aside from drilling, what particular skills from the oil and gas industry are transferable to, uh, well, geothermal is nominated, but any of the other industries, let's say? Uh, yeah, so if, if it's for me, uh, I'll talk about the wind yeah, stuff. Are you, Matthew? So I guess we could ask John in a minute about the geothermal. Uh, but I said for wind, it was you know, one of the topics I covered. It was drilling is not really one of the main areas that the wind energy is. It's anything from the studies all the way through the life cycle to construction, to operations, to maintenance, to decommissioning. So I think possibly John would be better suited for the geothermal part. All right, yeah, John. I, I can. Yeah, I could take the geothermal part. Um, it, it's really upstream skills um, in um, well construction. Uh, so going all the way from stuff like um, sort of land acquisition and prospecting, uh, understanding geology, you, you don't have to, because for these um, new geothermal systems, you're not producing fluid from a reservoir, you don't necessarily need to understand all the reservoir properties that um, you might need on a gas. But it is useful to understand what the geology is. And it's very useful to understand existing structures, things like natural fractures and pulps and so on, um, places where you might uh, potentially lose fluid or natural fractures that you might be able to take advantage of if you're drilling um, EGS uh, type wells. Uh, there'll also be skills in uh, completions and uh, things like um, reservoir monitoring. Um, one of the things that surprised me looking at um, some of the hydrothermal operators I was looking at outside of the UK is that um, they don't actually know the temperature of their reservoirs, uh, which uh, when you think you're actually trying to produce heat is um, I found remarkable. Um, so I think that there are opportunities for reservoir monitoring and um, also things like um, production optimization. Um, I think that there was a question that I saw come through on the chat about um, um, depletion or you know how, how long the heat will last basically and um, locally depleting the heat if, if you take more heat out of the um, well than the earth that the big nuclear reactor under our feet is putting in um, then it's temporarily going to, uh, to to deplete so there may be things like uh, production management where you switch between legs of wells or you even switch between wells in order to make sure that you're not um, removing heat faster than it's uh, being produced and naturally just making its uh, way to the surface. Once you get beyond the wells, I think the skills are more applicable to existing like sort of power generation skills. It, we really just, it's a different way of uh, creating steam to drive a turbine to uh, generate uh, electricity. And you know those skills are well known, but uh, in a different industry. I, I guess the one other thing that I've mentioned that I hadn't talked about with respect to drilling is rig design. Um, I think for drilling larger, higher temperature wells, uh, we may well require um, sort of bigger rigs, bigger pumps, and things like um, drilling mud chillers to cool the drilling mud down before it uh, goes into the uh, into the well, just to make it a little bit easier to, uh, to to do the drilling of these wells. Thank you, John. Well, on behalf of the audience, I want to thank all our speakers for their excellent presentations, and I thank the audience for the excellent questions that they put forward. Uh, we've taken due note of them. The speakers will see all the questions that have been put, and uh, we'll take account of these in our follow-ups. So with that, I wish you all a very safe rest of the day and a successful and healthy year to come. Thank you.